and I want to thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Kelsey. I am a student at EDM and also a member of the ISO. Um, tonight our meeting is called Lessons from Charlottesville, How We Fight and Defeat Fascism. And so we're going to have a speaker, Ashley Smith, who is on the editorial board of the International Socialist Review. Um, he's also on the steering committee of the International Socialist Organization and also an organizer of the upcoming protest in Boston this weekend, the anti-Nazi protest. Um, Ash is going to start our discussion. <laughs> he's going to speak for about a half hour. Um, and then we are also going to have a discussion afterwards. So, ready? So, I'm sure everybody is traumatized by what we've witnessed over the last week, and especially the murder of Heather Heyer, and I just think it's incredible that Susan Bro, who is her mother, got up at her funeral honorarium, basically, honoring her daughter, gave that speech, and said it used her speech about her daughter's death as a call to action for us to get out and protest the, the Nazis across the United States. And I think the, the key thing... The most important thing we learned out of Charlottesville is the mask has been ripped off the face of the so-called alt-right. This has been exposed as a sewer of white supremacy, Klansmen, neo-Nazis, and far-right paramilitary thugs. That's what we saw on the streets of Charlottesville. They don't care about freedom of speech at all. In fact, they're enemies of freedom of speech. They want to take our freedom of speech away. They want to take our democratic right to assembly away. They want to terrorize people of color in this country. They want to terrorize Jews. If you watch the HBO Vice documentary, you very much clearly see these people are old-style Nazis, and they don't care at all about freedom of speech. They also prove that, contrary to what Donald Trump said, they're all racists. Hardcore racist. Who else would defend a statue of Robert E. Lee but somebody who's a racist? Why would we defend a Confederate general anywhere in, in the United States? After all, the, we won the Civil War and abolished slavery and got rid of the Confederacy. That was a victory. That's a good thing. Why would anybody defend any of these, uh, uh, any of these statues? I really encourage everybody to watch that HBO Vice documentary. It's very easy to watch on, online, and you get a real sense for what these people are like. Um, so as people know, on Friday night, they did a Klan rally with burning torches. The only thing missing was the hoods from this rally. And if you listen to the chants that they, that they led, they chanted against Jews. They chanted, chanted the Nazi slogan, blood and soil. They gave the Sieg Heil salute. And they went after every oppressed group and targeted, quote unquote, commies obsessively through their entire rally. Um, and afterwards, they brutally beat DeAndre uh, Harris, a black activist who was part of the counter protest that, that evening. Saturday, they mobilized all those forces to an even bigger event. They got hundreds of neo Nazis, they got hundreds of Klan's people, people like David Duke who is basically a Klan's, a Klan's member, all sorts of white supremacists, all sorts of other hate groups, and they came in paramilitary style. If you look at what they came as, they had shields, clubs, automatic weaponry. That's who was on the streets of Char Charlottesville, and they came with the desire and aim to have a fight and to beat up people who were counter-protesting in, in the streets of Charlottesville. So James Fields took everything about that rally to its logical conclusion when he drove his car into an ISO banner and murdered Heather Heyer and injured 19 other people, including members of the IWW, members of the ISO, members of DSA, and members of Black Lives Matter, some of whom who are now suing, rightly, the white supremacists for the injuries they suffered on the streets of Charlottesville. The whole world saw this. It ripped the cover off the lie that we've endured for the last few months under the Trump regime, that there's this thing called the alt-right. We need to not say that anymore. They're white supremacists. They're neo-Nazis. They're far-right far paramilitary thugs. Our side, the counter-protesters, the anti-Nazis, actually proved themselves heroes. They stood up and protested in defense of Charlottesville and the people in Charlottesville from these paramilitary thugs who were coming to attack people in the town, especially people of color, trade unionists, 
uh, civil rights activists, and it was a coalition of people who came out to defend the city and the people of Charlottesville, clergy people, people like Cornell West, socialists, anarchists, Black Lives Matter activists, trade unionists, people from all over the southeast of the United States to defend their community against the attack from far-right paramilitary thugs who were bussed in from all over the country. And all they could manage was 300 people, but those 300 people are hard core, scary people, including someone from South Burlington who came from South Burlington all the way to Charlottesville. He got fired from his job at Pizzeria Uno. Not that I like Pizzeria Uno's boss, but I'm glad he lost his job and paid the price And and because we're going to have to make a lot of these Nazis pay the price for the murder that they committed. So all those people who protested against these people are heroes of our side. And we now have a martyr in, in Heather Heyer. And I think people really have to make her Facebook post that if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention, the North Star of our collective struggle against the emergence of fascism in, in, in the United States. We should mourn her, like, but like Mother Jones said, fight like hell for the living because these people are not done. They are organizing for Boston this weekend. They are organizing for Berkeley. And they've called nine demonstrations across the country this weekend against Google in defense of the sexist pig who didn't want affirmative action implemented in the corporation uh, of Google. Charlottesville, I think the second big lesson is it ripped the cover off the Trump administration and really exposed them in an indefensible fashion about what is inside the Trump administration, which I'll talk about in a second. Everybody probably saw Trump's initial speech, which was unforgivable. What in the world are you doing blaming both sides, Nazis, and anti-Nazis. If you don't have a moral compass that can decide which side you're on, what planet are you from? What planet are you living in uh, today? And David Duke and the other far-right people knew that he was giving tacit approval to what they did when he did the blame both sides uh, line. It's disgusting. Um, the reality is the far-right is solely to blame for the violence that happened in Charlottesville. They came ready to beat, shoot, and murder people, and that's what, they, that's what they did. Faced with such a threat, we must defend the right of people and activists to protect themselves, to defend themselves of this, against this kind of assault. The entire nation, and indeed the world, and even the establishment saw through Trump's lie when he said that about blame both sides. What he was really doing was giving support to the white supremacists. The GOP and the establishment freaked out, and they tried to discipline Donald Trump. So then he gave that second speech, which was so scripted and so phony, you could tell he was lying through his teeth about expressing sympathy with the victims in Charlottesville and condemning uh, uh, the, the white supremacists. Because in his blood, people should know, there's a long lineage of Klan-style politics in the Trump family, including his dad, who, was, who marched with the, with the Klan. So, uh, but immediately, because it was phony, the next day, he totally reversed course and went on a tirade attacking the protesters, attacking the left, and making them the, the, the real, the real um, uh, uh, problem. And uh, I, I love, there was one website that captured the insanity of Trump's blaming both sides brilliantly. They had a headline that said, Donald Trump says Rebel Alliance must also take blame for violence as Death Star had all the required permits. <laughs> that really explains the hypocrisy uh, of, the situ as, of the situation. Um, and then he defended the rights defense of the standing of Robert E. Lee's statue. Let's just think about that. Um, the Onion got it right <laughs> when they wrote a headline Trump warns removing Confederate statues could be slippery slope to eliminating racism entirely. <laughs> <laughs> totally correct. Trump said, "We are going. Uh, where are we going to stop with taking down of statues? We will be George Washington next. Thomas Jefferson next. Great idea. <laughs> They're all slaveholders. Why do we have any statue anywhere in this country to a slaveholder? Really." What's the moral compass of this society that would have statues that lionize slaveholders? That's nuts. It's completely ridiculous. It's a great idea. We should tear them all down. Tear them all down. 
Um, and what we should do is put them in museums and educate people about the real history of the United States. That's what they did with Nazi stuff in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. You put this in a museum and educate people about what the real history of the United States is, is all about. Trump's bananas stuff has fooled absolutely nobody, including his daughter's rabbi. If people haven't seen this, the rabbi who married Jared and Ivanka, who right now are hiding somewhere in Vermont, apparently, um, the rabbi came out and denounced, and Ivanka's Jewish. She converted to Judaism, if people know, as part of the marriage ceremony. So her dad is an anti-Semite that's supporting these white supremacists, and her rabbi is condemned. What are Jared and Ivanka going to do? <laughs> Trump's support of the white supremacist has, has really caused a profound crisis in his administration, and it's going to get worse, I think, because he's not going to stop, because that's his politics. His politics are becoming clear. We chanted when he came to Burlington, we know what's under that wig, a racist and a sexist pig. Back when he came to Burlington, in the when, whenever it was, I forget, it was cold, that's all I remember. <laughs> a long time ago, when he was running for president, it was a great demonstration. Um, so we knew that this was Trump's uh, politics, but the GOP have been making a truce with Trump. The capitalist class, the big corporations have had a truce with Trump because he's rolling in money for them, deregulating everything, destroying whole departments that tr protect the environment, civil rights and civil, civil liberties. Um, but this has really exposed them. Even now, the GOP are calling for the troika in his cabinet, the troika of racists and white supremacists to go. This is a big deal. And what's that troika? Steve Bannon, who gave a plat platform through Breitbart for the so-called alt-right, a term invented by Richard Spencer, who was on the ground in Charlottesville with the hardcore Nazi paramilitary forces. I talked to somebody who was in Charlottesville. He was right in the thick of the organizing of the terrorism in, in the streets. Another one is Stephen Miller, who was the right-hand man for Sessions, who is a white supremacist, and he's the attorney general. Then the worst, I think, is Stephen Gorka who is actually a member of a Hungarian Nazi organization. He have, we have a troika of white supremacists and Nazis at the heart of the Trump administration. And the GOP is worried about it. That's why all of them, including people who have supported him, are now critical of him. Even the capitalist class is like, oh my God. We like Trump raking in the money, but this stuff is out of control. So they all started resigning from his business council. Like... CEOs of major corporations have started to resign. Black CEOs, Jewish CEOs, regular Goyim CEOs are resigning from, from these things. So Trump was like, oh my God, my economic council is dissolving before my eyes, so I'm going to abolish both of them to cover up the flight of capital from supporting this, this administration. And it, it's not only the actual capitalists, but it's their capitalist press. The cover of Econ The Economist magazine, which is the Bible of the neoliberal ruling class, this is their cover of their forthcoming issue. It's Trump with a megaphone in the shape of a Klan hood. This is The Economist magazine, the international magazine of the neoliberal capitalist, um, capitalist class. So they are very worried about what, what Trump is, is doing. And as a result of all this, the exposure of the administration, the splits that have developed within the Republican Party, the Democratic Party with Trump, Trump's popularity has plummeted. The most recent poll has him at 34% popularity. And it's 67% don't trust him to make a decision on any domestic or foreign policy question. That is incredible wellspring of opposition that has been in further inflamed. I think we're also in a turning point for our side, for the resistance to Trump and the far right. After Charlottesville, people have returned to the streets everywhere. And it's stunning, the outpouring of solidarity and rage about Charlottesville. People in every town, every city, every tiny little village have had protests. My little village, which is really just an intersection where I grew up near Schenectady, New York, had a protest at the intersection 
with 50 people. I've never seen 50 people assemble in the town I grew up in, let alone do anything with the 50 people, except at the football game, which everybody always goes to. But, but 50 people rallied in Burn Hills, New York, of all places on planet Earth. So th this, this, this is a real sign. And if you add it up, probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of people marched in the following days after Heather Heyer's murder in, in Charlottesville. And this is really the first time since the airport protests, the Women's March, the science march and the climate march that people have returned to protest because what has happened since those marches is that people have been waiting for the Democrats to stop this man. But that's become something like the existentialist play waiting for Godot. Really, when is Godot going to come? We're not, we don't have time to wait for Godot to come and stop, stop Trump. After Charlottesville, people are ready, I think, in numbers that we haven't seen in a while to unite and fight the right themselves, not entrusting it to somebody else, but, but um, them, themselves. So they've taken the struggle um, into, their, into their own hands. So not only the outpouring immediately, but the question of Confederate statues. What are people doing? In Durham, North Carolina, they tore down a statue that was honoring conf the Confederate army. And then what did, you know, what it, what, and then they chanted, we are the revolution, which I thought was magnificent. That's great. It's Bernie's slogan. You get a sense of people returning to something in a real genuine, genuine way. In the wake of that, Baltimore took down every single Confederate memorial in the city. Fantastic. Now, and in Gainesville, um, Florida, same thing happening. P all, nothing w would have been done about these statues without people protesting and calling attention uh, to, to, this, to this history. Unsurprisingly, the city government and police force in Durham have charged those activists with vandalism. And the amazing thing today, I don't know if people saw it, hundreds of people appeared at the courtroom to plead guilty for tearing down the statue because they actually feel liberated by tearing down the statue. It was a multiracial contingent. Black, white, Latino, Asian, everybody was like, I'm guilty. If anybody's ever seen that movie, Spartacus, you should watch it. One of the great movies about a slave revolution that you can ever watch. In that movie, there's an attempt to isolate Spartacus and behead the revolution. And in the movie, you see hundreds and hundreds and thousands of slaves all say, I'm Spartacus. It was like that kind of moment in Durham, in Durham uh, uh, today. In reality, um, uh, we should be cheering the toppling of these staple statues all across uh, the United States. Many of the statues are in the north. Think about that. In Chicago, they're Confederate statues. There's a Nazi statue in, in Chicago that was sponsored by Mussolini that's still standing. Take these things down. Put them in a museum. Educate people about fascism, white supremacy, the Confederacy, so that we can learn from history instead of honor um, people who should not be honored. Um, I think that we're seeing people really begin to, to, to unite. And the most stunning thing was the statement from the great, great grandsons of Stonewall Jackson. I know people saw this, but the great, great grandsons of Stonewall Jackson published an open letter calling for the statue of Stonewall Jackson in Richmond, Virginia to be torn down immediately. This is what they said in the opening of their, uh, of their uh, open letter. They say, we are native Richmonders and also the great, great grandsons of Stonewall Jackson. As two of the closest living relatives to Stonewall, we are writing today to ask for the removal of his statue, as well as the removal of all Confederate statues from Monument Avenue. They are overt symbols of racism and white supremacy, and the time is long overdue for them to depart from public display. Overnight, Baltimore has seen fit to take this action. Richmond should too. That's incredible. They're the legacy of Stonewall Jackson is against the right. You get a sense of a deep wellspring of, of opposition um, uh, develop, developing. And why is this happening? Because people defended themselves in Charlottesville. Why is this happening? Because people protested in the streets immediately after to honor Heather Heyer and to say we will not let Nazis march in the United States. So we, I think, can now finally win the symbolic battle over the Civil War itself, which is the battleground of this argument, because the right marched in defense of the Confederacy. That's what they did in Charlottesville. We, as a nation, won the Civil War 
got rid of chattel slavery, and established bourgeois democracy. They want to support the challenge to all of that. That's what these people are marching to do. Now we can say, we put that in the past, and we're going to put it in the symbolic past and learn a deep lesson ab about all of this stuff. And it's not only the immediate stuff and the statues, it's people are mobilizing to the streets. This weekend, this Saturday in Boston, the same people who marched in Charlottesville are marching in Boston under the banner of free speech. They're defending free speech, which if you think a Nazi is for free speech, you should just read about Mussolini and Hitler. In response to this, 10,000 people, as of today on the Facebook page, are promising to march against the Nazis. That will be the biggest anti-Nazi rally we've seen. If those numbers hold for a couple of decades, even if it's 5,000, that shows people are not willing to let these hate mongers and terrorists march unopposed in the streets of the United States. Where is that? In Boston. Got it. We'll talk about organizing carpools, which we've got to get a lot of people from Burlington down to this march. Now we have to be clear that the Nazis and the white supremacists are not going away. Because I think a lot of people think, oh, they've been intimidated, they'll just go away. Watch the HBO Vice documentary. It's very clear what they think. They thought Charlottesville was a victory. The interviews with the hardcore traditional workers' party leader, Heinbach, and Richard Spencer, they think it was a victory. They think that they now can go on to what they want to do, which is Boston, Berkeley, the nine demonstrations against Google, and Richard Spencer's tour on campuses of the United States this fall everywhere under the banner of freedom of speech and opposition to, to left-wing professors on, on campuses. So they are very arrogant because what they thought was they were successful in. This is, and if you listen to Heinbach, he says it. We brought in hundreds of paramilitary forces. We got our people in. We got their materiel in. We didn't suffer big losses. We lost one guy to jail. But we're emerging with all our stuff, all our paraphernalia, all our members. They're battle-tested and ready for the next fights. That's how they see it, the hardcore of the fascists. But they overplayed their hand massively, and they, ex they broke the dog whistle. Now we know that it's not dog whistle politics in the United States. They have a bullhorn of white supremacy, neo-Nazi politics, and terrorism that they want to conduct on the people uh, of, the, of the United States. And that's a problem. Their soft support is beginning to splinter away because they don't want to touch it. Their sponsors at the GOP level are now squeamish, and the capitalist class doesn't like this stuff uh, whatsoever. So I think they're in danger of alienating the, the forces uh, around them. Even Bannon himself, if people read the interview that he did with Kuttner today, which we should talk about, because Kuttner and Bannon agree on a bunch of stuff. Nationalism, they agree. A liberal and a hard right person. They agree on nationalism. So Steve Bannon calls up Kuttner, who works for the American Prospect, a liberal, and does an interview. And what does he say about the neo-Nazis in Charlottesville? He calls them clowns because he likes the dog whistle. He doesn't like the bullhorn of this kind of white supremacist stuff that we saw in, 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 in Charlottesville. Nevertheless, they're not going to stop. And if you listen to Heinbach, he's very clear, the leader of the traditional workers' party. He sees his model as Golden Dawn in Greece. They are in open conversation with Golden Dawn, which is a large fascist party in Greece that is membership is concentrated in the police forces of Greece and they have parliamentary representation and they target immigrants and refugees with death squads. That's and the left and unions and everything else, they hate everybody. But that's the model. And so they have a plan to build out of this hardened core um, for a future mass uh, fascist movement. So we really have a fight on our hands. And I think to win this, we have to be clear about what fascism is its class nature, its program, and what its aims are. And we have to really talk turkey about, about what, what these people are. I think the best thing that people can read is Leon Trotsky's writings on fascism. Fascism in Big Business by Daniel Guerin is another really good book. Fascism, Stalinism, and the United Front, by, which is edited volumes of Leon Trotsky on fascism, and the struggle against fascism in Germany by, by Leon Trotsky. I encourage people to read the analysis because it's the unsurpassed best analysis of the roots of fascism in capitalist society where it comes from, what it does, what its class nature is, what its aims are. And he basically argues that fascism emerges in a deep crisis of the capitalist system. Its political leadership base is in the small business class, what Marxists call the petty bourgeoisie. 
small business leaders, especially in isolated, more rural towns, which are hammered in an economic crisis, hate workers because they're bosses, they're little bosses, they hate workers, and they despise the big capitalists. Both those classes are relatively socially insulated from a crisis. So in a period of deep crisis, the petty bourgeoisie, these small boss business owners, get driven into a frenzy, and they start building a mass movement that speaks anti-capitalism, but targets working class people and oppressed people with the aim of building a mass movement to smash working class organization, to scapegoat and murder uh, oppressed people, especially people of color, Jews in the case uh, of Germany, uh, uh, obviously, and impose a dictatorship that takes all our democratic rights away. That's in a nutshell its, it's uh, program. They build their mass base and, you know, look at Italy, brown shirts in the streets, you know, look in Germany, brown shirts in the streets. That is massive rallies of paramilitary thugs. Think about what we saw in Charlottesville. Imagine hundreds of thousands of people. That was their goal. That's their goal that they want to um, uh, uh, achieve. Um, and they find a following, not only in that petty bourgeois class, but also among desperate workers whose unions and political parties have betrayed them and not delivered a solution. Out of despair, sections of the working class can be won to this absolutely reactionary uh, fascist, fascist uh, uh, program. The capitalist class in normal periods don't like these people. They like bourgeois democracy because it works to insulate them from class rebellion from below. So they don't like to go for the whole dictatorship program. But if they're faced with mass resistance in the streets, they will turn and fiscally sponsor the Nazis to smash working class and oppress people's uh, struggle from below. That's exactly what happened in Italy. It's exactly what happened in, in Germany. And we can see the same dynamic beginning in some societies in the United States. In India, a section of the capitalist class supports the Nazi organization called the RSS, which is the heart of the ruling party called the BJP, which is in government right now in India. In Greece, a section of the capitalist class has sponsored Golden Dawn. And think about Trump. He is flirting with these people, and he's a billionaire. So you can see the class dynamics uh, 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 of, the, of the situation. The Nazis are very small now. They're very small now. 300 people was a national mobilization. 300, 400, whatever the numbers are. That was a national mobilization. They can grow in the period that we're in. We're seeing it internationally, and they can grow here. And so the stakes of getting this right right now are extremely high. And um, we can, I'll quote, I've never done this in a public talk. I'll quote Hitler and Goebbels to explain why this moment matters. Hitler said, and this is in the book Fascism and Big Business, which people should read. Only one thing could have broken our movement. If the adversary had understood its principle and from the first day had smashed with the utmost brutality the nucleus of our new movement. Goebbels, I don't even know how to pronounce his name because I've never said it in public. Goebbels, whatever. He's a Nazi. He said, he said, if the enemy had known how weak we were, it probably would have reduced us to jelly. It would have been, would have crushed, it would have been crushed in blood in the very beginning of our work. That is, that's, that's what we are at. And so what we do right now is of decisive um, uh, significance. I'm going to go like five more minutes. Okay. Um, so that, that's the moment we're in. And so we can stop this now if we do the right stuff. Um, if, and if we actually uh, uh, begin to organize in, in the right kind of way. So I'll just end on this. What's the best way to fight the, the, the fascist threat in, in the United States? One, it's understanding that we do have one. It's not going to go away. It's there. We cannot ignore them. That's a proven failure. If we ignore them, we give them the, face, the space to organize. Imagine if there had been no counter-protest in Charlottesville. They would have just gone about their business and organized their forces. To do what? To get bigger, more soft support, to then be bigger in Boston, bigger in Berkeley, which is their next two big, big uh, targets. So ignoring them will not work. We can't look to the police or the state to stop the Nazis. Very important. First of all, with the cops, a lot of cops are Nazis. A lot of cops are Nazis. Look at Golden Dawn, a disproportionate base of their political party is in the police forces uh, of Greece. That was true of Mussolini's uh, Italy. That was true of Hitler's Germany. And we should learn from Black Lives Matter. Do not expect 
the cops to defend oppressed people or working class people. They're strike breakers and killers of black people in, in the United States. Second, what do cops do on demonstrations? They protect the Nazis. We will see that in Boston this weekend. We are going to see a massive deployment of the police force to protect their right to assemble and march. That is, that's what the cops are going to be doing, preventing us from directly counter-protesting them. That's what we'll see on the streets of Boston. Third, if we support the state to stop them and support their restrictions of rights, they will use it against the left, against workers' organizations, against oppressed groups. Remember, Trump is in charge of the American state. What does he think about Black Lives Matter? He thinks it's a terrorist organization. So if we hope for Trump, who's the head of the American state, to take care of the Nazis, we're entrusting power to one of our enemies who will use it against our side. So, can't trust the cops or the state. Nor can we look to the established capitalist parties. Obviously, we can't hope for the GOP to stop the growth of white supremacy. Donald Trump runs the GOP. He has whipped these people up into a frenzy all across the United States. But we also can't look to the Democrats to stop the development of the Nazi menace. Not because they're sponsors, although people should know something about the history of the Democratic Party. It had Klan's members all over it. It was the party of white supremacy. It was the party of the slaveholders. There's a deep, nasty history of the Democratic Party. That's not them now. But what they've done in their economic and political program is lay the basis for the growth of this kind of far-right stuff. Their austerity mudgers, their budget cuts, their attacks on immigrants, their attacks on Chinese competition. Think about all that rhetoric fuels and legitimizes the, 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 the right that says, you, want, you like that stuff? Wait till we do it. So they are part of the, the problem. In right now, the Democrats are defending the right of Nazis to march. In Boston, the mayor said, I hate the Nazis, they shouldn't come, but he just gave them a permit to march. Like, to be honest about the situation. Even worse, in Portland, Oregon, when we were organizing as the ISO, along with a bunch of other people, a big anti-Nazi protest, Jesse Jackson flew in to try and get, convince people to pull out of the demonstration and not protest the assembly of the Nazis in the immediate aftermath of the murders that the Nazis committed in Portland, Oregon. So what should our strategy be if it's not those? What Trotsky argued for was a united front of workers and oppressed organizations to con directly confront the far right. That's what we have to take the struggle into our own hands. We have to confront the hardcore, split them from their soft support, and prevent them from growing and organizing. And we do that by mass democratically planned organization that plans a mass action to directly uh, confront them. In Charlottesville, our forces tragically were way too small for the task. We were at rough parity with the far right. There were 300, 400 of them. Maybe we were 500, 400, I don't know. But we were at rough parity. These people came ready for a total fight. And our side is not able, if you looked at Wayne, he what is not, at Heimbach's group, these people were scary bodybuilders. A bunch of wimpy leftists are not going to be able to defeat these people in small numbers. Small bands of heroic people are not going to be able to stop them, stop them. So we have to do way better in the coming actions. I think the model is beginning to develop across the country where you can see what will work. In Portland, Oregon, they got 75 organizations to endorse a counter-demonstration within proximity of the Nazis. They got 1,000 people out. Now in Berkeley, we see a whole nother scale of organization. Berkeley is coming up not this weekend, but the following weekend. I'll read the list of endorsers of an anti-Nazi demonstration. The slogan of the demonstration, by the way, by the Nazis is, we're going to attack the Marxists. And by, the, by Marxists, the Nazis mean Muslims, liberals, the ISO, the DSA, the IWW. That's their most hated group of people is Marxism because we're their biggest enemy, and they lump everybody inside. And that's at the heart of the Trump administration. The guy that just got canned from the Trump administration wrote a memo in which he said the main opponents of the Trump administration are globalists, Muslims, Marxists, and anarchists. That's, that's their worldview of the situation. So here's the list of endorsers, because people are understanding that we're all threatened by this, and we all have to unite, stand up, and fight. AFSME, 3299, the Berkeley uh, uh, Union. Alameda... County Labor Council, 
Alameda Black Lives Matter, Bay Area Communication Access, Berkeley Federation of Teachers. We should talk to the BEA. <laughs> the Berkeley Federation of Teachers is sponsoring this demonstration. The Berkeley Fellowship of Uni Unitarian Universalist Social Justice Committee. Berkeley Forest School, imagine that. The whole Forest School is endorsing the demonstration. The CPUSA, the Berkeley Progressive Alliance, Black Lives Matter from Reno Sparks, and it goes on. All the DSA chapters, all socialist action, socialist alternative, and then UAW 2865, um, CWA 9119, the War Resisters League, on and on and on. 75 organizations have now endorsed this. Big labor organizations, big liberal organizations. That bodes the potential of turning out mass numbers in, in the streets. And I think what happens in Boston will be a decisive lead about which direction all of this is going to go. So right now, as I said, the Facebook page of the Fight White Supremacy demonstration at the march has 10,000 people on Facebook promising to go. We've organized a socialist contingent with Socialist Alternative, DSA, and Solidarity that has now, uh, I think, 200 people saying they're going to attend that and 370 who are promised or interested in attending. So you can see the dynamic. Of, and the, that march that we're supporting was organized by the Black Lives Matter activists. So 10,000 people, bunch of socialists, Black Lives Matter, the... the, the um, uh, Massachusetts Teachers Association in Boston just endorsed the demonstration. Talking about, like, this is what we need to do if we're going to assemble the, the numbers that are necessary to run the Nazis off the street. This is the strategy to smash the fascists. This is the way to actually um, win. And I want to say one thing about the question of self-defense, because a lot of people are talking about it. I think we need to be very clear. We are going to win by mass action, by dwarfing them with huge numbers. That's our power. That's our moral credibility. We are many. They are a tiny bunch of scumbags. That's our moral strength. And what we have to do is we reserve the right to defend ourselves against their violence. So they're the instigators of the violence. We are in self-defense. That will be morally convincing to people who are iffy about going out on a protest. So our stance and our discipline in the marches is of extreme importance because if we fall into the trap of counterviolence, they will use that to push our soft support away. So we have to be very sharp on, on this question. And the final point is this. If Trotsky's right, which I think he is, that fascism grows out of capitalism, it grows out of the middle class, it becomes a mass movement that's a threat to all our democratic liberties, we have to start building a positive program for social change that's not only in the negative that we are going to stop the Nazis. We will do that. But we have to build into that effort a positive program that says we want single payer now. Not in 10 years. Now. We want 15 an hour. Now. We want reparations for black people. Now. We want affirmative action for women at Google now. We have to have a whole program of immediate demands that we can galvanize people around the politics of hope, of liberation, of justice, of equality. That's very important. And we have to connect that struggle for immediate aims to what we really need is a total transformation of this society. Until we get rid of the system that we live in, which breeds the Nazis, they will keep reappearing as they did in the Great Depression as they are reappearing now after the Great Recession. It's in the bacilli of capitalism to generate these. And to do that, we got to get organized. Everybody should join an organization on our side. I don't care what it is. Join DSA, IWW, pick your politics, join it and build an organization. If you're an individual, you have no ability to influence the mass direction of the struggle that we're going into. Everybody needs to get organized. Everybody needs to join and build a union. Everybody needs to start building a united front of all our sides, all the different organizations on our side to confront the Nazis. And I think we need to build a new socialist movement that says, you know what, the problem is the system. We need a whole different kind of society. If you like those ideas, you should join DSA. You should join the ISO. You should join Socialist Alternative. You should join and build the burgeoning socialist movement in the United States because we have to change this society. That's the way we're going to honor Heather Heyer. That's the way we're going to live the promise of what Susan Bro, her mother, said in that speech that we watched. So build the struggle against the Nazis. We will say to them, never again in the United States or any country around the world. We are going to build a resistance to stop these people and fight for a whole different kind of society that puts people first.
Okay, first, I just want to underscore how Nazi this movement is, at, is. because um, Trump said, there's a quote, not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. That's what he said in his rant against the left. And then I want to, I want to quote the people who are the organizers of this thing. Matthew Heimbach, which I talked about. Hitler, good guy. <laughs> Richard Spencer, who has a direct connection to Breitbart, invented the term alt-right, and has a direct connection to Bannon in the White House. Richard Spencer, Hitler had limited ambitions. Richard Spencer, again, I was born too late for the Crusades and too early for the conquest of Mars, but I was born at the right time for the race war. This guy's touring campuses this fall. He got banned from University of Florida. He's bringing a lawsuit to win the right to speak at the University of Florida. They've got 15 campuses scheduled where this guy is going to be speaking. Jason Reza Giorgiani, another one of the organizers on the ground. Adolf Hitler believed that the mass base of mundane reality could be melted down and willfully forged into a work of art. Wow. Andrew Anglin of the Daily Stormer. I ask myself this, in all things, what would Hitler do? Andrew Anglin, again, in the Daily Stormer, which is luckily losing its right to find access to the interweb, um, he said, next stop, Charlottesville. Final stop, Auschwitz. Fuck. These are the people we're, we're talking about. So the fear that people talked about is real. That's a re if you're not scared, you're not paying attention because these people are scary. And so everything about our side has to be about overcoming the fear of regular people to join the anti-fascist marches. Because until we get regular people, it will be small bands doing fistfights with way better trained Nazis. And we will lose those fights. We lost the last time the Boston battle happened where it was 300 Nazis and 250 Antifa people. We, our side got creamed. They won that battle. We cannot fight in that kind of way. So the key thing is that will instill confidence confidence in people is one, if we get every organization we possibly can to join our united front. So it's not just the anarchists, it's not just the socialists who are essential for this. It's not just the radical left, it's not the organizations the radical left, it's the unions. So we get teachers marching in union T-shirts, like Mikey, I hope you're coming in your union T-shirt this weekend. We need contingents of union members in union T-shirts so that people see our side is marching, where we have women's organizations marching in the hats in, on our demonstration, where we have, we have LGBT people flying the rainbow flag, where we have the people who turned out in the women's march, the science march, the, the, the climate march, and the airport protests. Regular people joining the movement. That's the key. What we have to do is figure out how we create that coalition. That is the test. And I'll just talk through how Berkeley created this incredible coalition. They met for the first time three and a half months ago with five people in the room. Now they had a meeting two nights ago with 75 people representing I think 50 or 60 organizations. And they all voted unanimously call, to call for a National Day of Action for the 26th and 27th, that weekend, in solidarity with their demonstration. They have longshoremen marching, which are disproportionately black. And the Klan is putting up Klan literature at the ports of, of the Bay Area now. So they are coming for the unions, not only for the left, the anarchists, the commies. They're coming for all of us. And so we have to, we have to really uh, 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 understand that and then organize with that in, in, in mind. And I think that people brought up the question of the 1930s and Germany. And I think we have to go back and learn our history about what happened in Germany and how Hitler came to power. He could have been stopped. Before I talk about that, I want to talk about Burlington and Berlin. Because we had two comrades who are members of the ISO that led the, Burlington, the Berlin demonstration against the Nazis in solidarity with Charlottesville just yesterday. Edna von Holm, and people will remember our comrade who I've now just... Kathleen Brown, 
were the two organizers of the Solidarity with Charlottesville march in Berlin, and the crowd went bananas when they spoke in their bad German before the audience about the solidarity between Burlington and Berlin. That's the kind, everybody all around the world is watching what we're doing. So we can have a sense of solidarity across borders. But that what is the big lesson of Germany when Hitler came to power? The, the mass organizations of our side in the 1930s were far, far bigger than Hitler's Nazis. Even when Hitler was marching with tens of thousands of people, we had unions and political parties of the left, the SPD, the Social Democratic Party, and the Communist Party, that between them had millions of members and followers who, if they united, could have crushed Hitler. But sectarianism on both sides prevented the necessary unity and mobilizing of that force to stop the genesis of Hitler coming to power. And then how did Hitler actually come to power? He was appointed by Hindenburg after he lost the election because people thought, I will vote for the lesser evil. Hindenburg will stop Hitler. Hitler gave, Hindenburg gave Hitler power. So we have to do it. We can't entrust this fight to the people uh, uh, up above. So then to talk about the concrete questions about Antifa. I think the key thing is everybody who's fighting Nazis, we're all on the same side. We all want to stop the Nazis. Then there's a strategic debate about what is necessary to win. And I think the key thing, if we want to forge the kind of coalitions that are going to be necessary, we have to have democratic spaces where people debate, discuss, and plan, and vote. And those votes are binding on the members of the coalitions, and we have marshals around our contingents on demonstrations. This is what the trade union movement knows or used to know, has to relearn how you marshal on a picket line and in a mass protest your own demonstration because the Nazis, the cops, the state will send in provocateurs to discredit our side. So once we've democratically de debated and discussed and voted on what we're going to do, we have to enforce that strategy. That does not mean that we don't lend our solidarity to people who are trying to fight. We always stand with people who are trying to fight the Nazis. But we have to have this disagreement, because the Antifa strategy is not a winning strategy. We're about winning and stopping these people before they grow into a, a, uh, a mass force. So how do we go about that? I think, number one, DSA, IWW, Black Lives Matter, VTJP, Vermonters for Just Peace in Palestine, um, uh, the Workers' Center, RAD, um, justice for all, everybody's got to get in a room and talk. What are we going to do? Because it's just a matter of time before the far right comes to Burlington, comes to UVM, and does this stuff. And we already know they're doing the vigilante stuff like you've described, intimidating people. That's happening. So we need to come together. We need to have a panel where everybody says what's going on locally, nationally, internationally, so that we're prepared to deal with that. That's where the question of educating people is. We need to have forums like that will discuss that in each and every place we can organize it and find out the person right next to you who will help organize a panel to talk about what the Confederate flag means. Because a lot of people don't even know what it means, and they're just wearing the shirt with a hot, not a high level uh, of consciousness of it. So we have to do a lot of that education stuff, and then we have to prepare to mobilize in, in, in big numbers. So everybody who can go really should go this, this Saturday to Boston. Figure out the carpool, get yourself there, call in sick to work. Who cares about work? You've got to call in sick. I'm just like everybody does it when they want to go on a bender and get drunk. They call in sick the next day. This matters more than your drinkathon. So, like, really call in sick and come. And then, you know what? Come back and say, I want to talk to my coworkers. I want to talk to my fellow students. I want to talk to my church members. I want to talk to my synagogue. I want to talk to my local union. And I want to tell them what is going on and what we need to do in this society uh, to stop this stuff um, from, from, from going. Final thing, I really want to agree with David. Uh, you are so right. Is your name David in the back with the yellow? Yeah. yeah, I really agree with you. Because I think that what Hillary Clinton said during the campaign about a basket of deplorables was disgraceful. It was anti-working class horseshit, frankly, from an enemy. She's on the capitalist side of every single question. Pro-imperial, pro-every-free-trade deal is in the back pocket of every big corporation in the United States. Every Wall Street financier, she has contempt for working class people. And so to lump all Trump voters as just unredeemable racists basically says from the Democratic Party, we have nothing to offer you. And frankly, that's true. And for a lot of the people that I grew up with in Schenectady, New York, who are now 
in that basket of deplorables. You know, that, that town voted for Donald Trump. Those are a lot of good working class people who've been abandoned and abused by this system, and they are dying in the opioid crisis. Yeah. We need to address that crisis front and center and said, you know what, we have an alternative for you. Working class demands, $15 an hour, jobs program, single payer, but, and this is a big argument in the Sanders movement, we cannot counterpose the economic demands to the demands against oppression because those two things are inextricably linked. Because we have to say, we are for an economic program for all working class people, and you know what? There are special oppressions, racism, sexism, homophobia, immigrant bashing, that we need specific treatment of and reparation and, and adjustments in our society. And that's important to win people around our economic program to that. Because if we're going to unionize any workplace in the United States, it's multiracial, it's men and women, it's gay and straight, it's immigrant and native. So if we on the economic program don't have inbuilt the fight against oppression, we are not going to forge the kind of fighting unity that we need to win those kind of immediate economic demands and show that our side is for the liberation of all, not just on class terms, but on every single Single, uh, uh, oppression. That's why the demand around Google is extremely important. We're for affirmative action for women and for people of color in that racist and sexist corporation, even though you got liberal blah 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 from the top of Google. <laughs> Look at its employment patterns. It's all white, all male. That's bullshit. So we have to speak on both the economic front and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the questions uh, of oppression. I think a new left is being forged right now that can begin to overcome these hurdles. And so I really encourage people, join a socialist organization. Join DSA, join the ISO, join whatever socialist organization, because we've got a battle plan based on a lot of history for immediate demands and then for a long-term solution to this mess in our world, which is only going to be resolved through working class revolution and a new socialist democracy. Frankly, that's the only way we're going to solve it in the United States and internationally. So if you're not a socialist, become one. Get a copy of Socialist Worker. Talk to us. Come to this demonstration. Fight like hell. We've got to win against the fascists, our immediate class demands, our demands against oppression, and then the long-term fight. Because it's only going to get worse. This is the height of the boom right now. You all feeling great. <laughs> this is as good as it's going to get. It's just a matter of time before the next recession comes. So we have to get way more serious. And the more the economic situation gets worse, the nastier the Nazis are going to become. So we've got a lot at stake. Great meeting. Let's go out and kick some Nazi butt in Boston.